Uh, sir, having the research interest in power electronics and drives has monitoring of electron, uh, electrical machines, power quality, non conversation sources of energy. Uh, sir, he also published many papers uh, in research, uh, like one and two papers paper in national and international journals, organized more than three and seven FDP in uh, different institutes. Uh, sir, has supervised more than 11 and 20 uh, PhD scholar and MTech scholar. He has um, uh, he is also having two he has also completed two sponsored projects uh, from various industries. So I also welcome Professor Ari Gupta sir, uh, and we are uh, also very fortunate to have you sir as a chief guest. So uh, just I want to uh, hand over uh, this session to uh, Principal sir, Dr. Shivlal. Uh, Shivlal sir. This is in third webinar on cutting edge technology and first international webinar on artificial intelligence, RTU quota. Chief guest of the webinar and the speakers, Professor P. K. Sharma at R&D Photo Gage. Welcome all the many states of India. Again, I welcome to our guests and please subscribe and like our YouTube channel. And for more details about the college, E resources developed by the college faculty members. Please visit our website www.gcmaswada.ac.in or edu.gcmaswada.ac.in. This webinar is organized by the support of TechUpthard of MHRD India. So, a special thanks to TechUpthard and our mentor institute, BVM Vidyanagar, Gujarat. Thank you, Himansu. Please continue this webinar. Uh, thank you, sir. Himansu. Thanks for your hello. Thank you, sir. I think hello. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir, uh, for your kind, uh, valuable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, Gupta sir, and I also want to hand over the session to Professor Aray Gupta sir. Please, sir. Hello, good morning to all of you. Good morning, sir. So, uh, I have to speak now? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Principal uh, Professor Shivlal. I consider it that uh, because Shivlal is from RTU Kota, so I consider it is an achievement of RTU Kota also. Am I right? Shivlal, you are there? Shivlal? I am there, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hello. Yes, sir. I am there. And then, uh, thanks to your uh, tech uh, third, basically, uh, I heard a lot of uh, things about uh, Shivlal that uh, in a very limited resource, and uh, he is giving good uh, quality education there, and uh, he has utilized very nicely, <coughs> very smartly, and very intelligent, intelligently the uh, tech fund. So I think this is also comes under this intelligence control. So when we speak about basically intelligence, then the intelligence is important, whether it is artificial or it is natural. So, what we do actually when we work in this nowadays, that uh, uh, we are dealing with the machines every day. So, nowadays, we are dealing every day with human. So, what we are doing, 
the intelligence component of human we are inducing in the machines and the machine is taking decision like a human and sometimes the machine takes better decision because what the programming we are doing the machine works like that so now it is the time of the computer field we are de dealing with the uh, machine language then artificial intelligence then computer uh, data system and everything so this or now it is in the this covid you know pandemic situation there is nothing to explain much everything we are doing whether it is a online classes online exam <coughs> online uh, laboratory that is called virtual classrooms and virtual laboratory in that case we all are learning with the machines we are giving education on machines and nowadays what we are doing we are conducting now classes also because we are not comfortable to follow students in the classroom so what we are doing we are giving them all the contents online using uh, basically different different mechanisms so this is all comes under this artificial intelligence uh, still basically we are not uh, having the complete this system with our students so we are not basically prepared to take their yeah. online exams because students are at a different uh, remote places internet facilities are not up to that level so we we are not uh, basically completely uh, we cannot completely rely on this system so that we are going to conduct of line examinations offline examinations is still having lot of problems because the student has to come from the different places to your institute you have to take lot of care uh, uh, so we are in dilemma actually the what to do but in all this thing this artificial intelligence or this computer system make us comfortable to run our system during this pandemic situation so it's a very good seminar you are doing sivla and i am sure that students thank you sir faculty and our connected uh, affiliated colleges all will be benefited out of this uh, webinar and i basically again i congratulate to you for conducting such a wonderful seminar and uh, i am sure that everybody will be benefited out of it thank you very much for inviting thank you sir thank, thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind word. Uh, so this is Abhi Jit Singh, and I welcome you all again. I'm feeling very honored to introduce the, an eminent professor. He's a working as a associate professor at a school of engineering and design science, Najar Bay University, Sajadastan. Uh, Professor Sivlal, Professor Sivlal, I want to interrupt to you. I have another webinar. Yes, sir. If you, per, if you yes, permit, sir. Yes, sir. I, I can leave. If you permit me, I want. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Hello. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Arvind Gupta, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, I request to my colleague, uh, Mr. Abhishek Singh, sir. Uh, he is currently HRD in Electrical Department to so introduce uh, our resource person, Professor Jamwal, and hand over the session to uh, Professor Jamwal. Abhishek, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, I am very honored to introduce. Professor Prashant K. Jamwal sir and is working as an associate professor at a school of engineering and design science, Nazar Bay University, Kazakhstan. And he had done his PhD in postdoctoral from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. And he is actively pursuing research in artificial intelligence, multi objective evaluation optimization, mechatronic systems, biomedical robotics, and fuzzy mathematics. 
and he is applying all this technology to develop development of medical robots for the rehabilitation and the surgical applications besides the development of improved algorithm for cancer data analysis he has more than 25 years of teaching and research experience and has published many research articles in reputed international journals and companies professor prashant has won many awards such as best paper award in companies best digital solution award for his medical robots uh, asian university alliance scholars award and recently united nations acknowledged one of his robotics project as one of the top 20 innovative project in the world and he is working as editor for the international journal of biomechatronics and bio robotics and as a reviewer with a few international journals and conference of a report so professor jambal led many government funded research projects and has so far received research grants worth more than uh, 5 million dollars including a prestigious world bank grant so we are very so we are very fortunate to have to have professor professor jambal, jambal uh, for a technical session so now i will hand over the session to professor jambal sir sir <clears throat> yeah good morning everyone and i'm really happy to be good morning sir here with Simple. all of you Simple. and i always like to <laughs> keep coming back to <laughs> Uh, you know, RTU and uh, affiliated colleges and students are also dear to me. Can you hear me all? Yes, sir. Okay. So, with uh, 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 all of you, and try to share the knowledge which I have about <coughs> artificial intelligence. Um, it's not a new subject. but uh, uh, recent it has um, um it has been being used in many disciplines many applications um the size in fact uh, the algorithms if we talk about basic uh, <coughs> neural networks and genetic algorithms it was existing like for three decades but suddenly because many people have started using it and they they can appreciate uh, the advantages uh it is uh, <clears throat> it is uh, you know taking rounds and it has become buzz of uh, uh the science uh, uh, <clears throat> innovations basically if you talk about the technology uh it 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 was existing long back i mean uh, technologies that we are using today for artificial intelligence for iot for sensing for so many things the technology technological advances advancement it it was it 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 happened like maybe 3 decades or 4 decades before but there's always a, a right time for the technology to be accepted adapted adapted accepted by, by by people by industries and so this is the right time when it has uh, you know started being accepted uh, <clears throat> specifically you know with the with this fourth uh, revolution of industry we, we we normally call as industry 4.0 which has embraced all the developments around it in terms of <coughs> big data analytics in terms of um, artificial intelligence in terms of iot so all this put together uh, it's termed the, these days as industry 4.0 is the, the fourth revolution in industry so that has also clicked Uh, this increased popularity of ai and people have started you know becoming interested or inquisitive or curious to know what this is so um before losing further time i'll quick uh from the very basics fundamentals of artificial intelligence i'll gradually take you all to the um state of the art research in artificial intelligence and how it can be used i'll also discuss some of my own research projects and yeah so and then i'll conclude so if some of you can confirm can you see my screen now yes sir yes sir 
Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. And if I go on full screen mode, can you still see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> Thanks. So you are able to see my screen and um, it's, it's a full screen. So this uh, this basically is to introduce myself. Uh, yeah. So <coughs> as you can see, if you go clockwise, I did my post graduation from IIT Roorkee. I was graduated from NIT Lahabad. Previously, it used to be called REC, I mean REC. So I did my post graduation from IIT Roorkee and I did get a gold gold medal there. I think uh, the, the the score which I have CGP it is still unbroken. My CGP was like 9.78 and I've been told that <coughs> uh, I'm still uh, still my record is unbroken there. I did my PhD and postdoctoral uh, <coughs> studies in University of Auckland. Then I worked for a year there. Then I returned back to Rajasthan Technical University where I worked for close to 12, 13 years. These days I'm working in the Nazarbayev University, which is a flagship research university of Kazakhstan named after the president. Now, <coughs> if you have time, I'll quickly go give you an introduction about my university here. Um, uh, to tell you uh, first that those who are interested in their postgraduate studies can actually contact me because my university <coughs> can give uh, up to 90% uh, discount or scholarships to deserving candidates. So here's the introduction about my university. It'll take maybe two minutes. So I hope I'm audible and you can see my slide. This is uh, where I wanted to start with. Um, so you have a brief introduction from me. Next, the agenda for today's uh, talk, I'm uh, considering machine learning, different AI approaches. I'll talk about um, 
just two of these AI approaches in brief, which is which are neural networks and genetic evolution. And then I'll discuss my research. So the entire agenda I have divided into several <clears throat> topics here you can see in the contents. I'll browse through these one after the other and then try to explain and discuss uh, around these topics. So for instance, <clears throat> let's start from this data analytics part, part force. So I'll talk about data analytics, what it is actually. And then I'll try to explain the different differences between artificial intelligence and machine learning. Later, I'll give you an overview of artificial intelligence and algorithms. We'll go slightly deep into the deep neural network, try to understand how these can be, uh, what these algorithms are and how these can be used. I'll also talk about genetic evolution, how it is can be coded, how it is coded into the algorithms and can be used to, you know, enhance the deep learning uh, neural network. And then obviously, as I said, I'll talk about my applications in to research and I'll also take you to my lab and, and show you what we have done. So talking about this data analytics, basically, this is an upcoming career which people have uh, are observing. You know, um, a few couple of years back, there was a boom of software engineering and software engineering professionals. Uh, jobs related to software engineering were <coughs> were very, uh, you know, uh, highly paid. But nowadays that software engineering job has been replaced by the job of data scientists. So people have started talking about data, its analysis, and then analytics. So so, so, so the, the prospective data scientists should have deep understanding of statistical procedures, should also have deep understanding of artificial intelligence, uh, approaches and together you should be able to solve the problems related with the big data analytics. So uh, I like to explain there's a, there's a difference between analysis and analytics. So when you talk about analysis, it's simply analyzing the present given data to you in different uh, indices. But when it comes to analytics, you're actually analyzing the data and creating a model from the data uh, so that the same model can be used for further data analysis of similar sort of. So <clears throat> when you talk about data, there are different kinds of data that we encounter with in our daily life. It could be a text data, as you can see here. Um, the text data can be converted into binary and then can be analyzed through a computer. The data could be an image data, which has to be once again converted into a language which computer can understand. The computer can only understand the language of binary digits. It could be, the data could be in, in, in the form of some animations, as you can see here. Data could also be a voice signal, a sound signal, and it could be a video, or, or maybe a picture, which you need to analyze as what's, what's happening there, what's going on there, and make a decision. So after the data types, we need to understand what is data analytics. So basically, given the data, we, need, we, we normally perform three kinds of analysis. The first is the first one is called descriptive analysis, where we try to find out as what has happened, what has happened with the process. Um, this, this, the second kind of uh, this analysis that we perform is called predictive analysis for the given from the given data we try to predict what is going to be happen in future if you if we continue with the current trend if we continue with the current process what will happen in future where will we uh, where it will lead us to or where will be after let's say two years or three years or five years this kind of a predictive analysis but there's another kind of analysis that we can do and it's called pres prescriptive analysis so it gives us a prescription. It gives us uh, remedies that, okay, if we have done something, I mean, the data shows that we are not progressing or we, we, are, we are generating losses or whatever. But if you do these remedies, if you do take these corrective actions, then probably you can mitigate the risk, you can uh, <clears throat> mitigate the losses. So that's another prescriptive analysis, right? 
the, the process of data analytics, as I said, it is different from analysis. It's, it's um, analysis plus the modeling. So the entire process of data analytics I've put down into these stairs. So first of all, to perform this data analytics, we need to identify what kind of data is required. And then it's a big exercise that we do. Once we have identified the kind of data that we need, we need to acquire the data. Now, data collection itself is a is a is a large area of research, and there are various techniques of uh, which we can use for data collection. And after the data has been collected, we go for uh, its processing, and the data can be processed using various statistical tools. Uh, classification tools, there are many really things. Now, after this data processing and the data cleaning, it goes parallel. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of data which is not required for our analysis, and we call it uh, a noise. The data which is required, which is useful, you call it a signal, which is not required is called noise. We need to filter this noise from the data, and so there we do cleaning of the data. Now, once we have done all that, then we create a model. So many, many classifiers can be used for modeling, or it could be as simple as a, you know, fitting a best, uh, best fit line or a best fit curve into the data. So it's kind of a modeling between inputs and outputs. But then starting from very basic um, Excel generated best fit lines could be uh, various graphic, uh, graph based uh, tools or machine learning. Um, could be artificial intelligence, uh, could be a simple controller that you can generate, produce, I mean, design. So there, they can be, the, the modeling can be performed in various ways. It could be numerical modeling, it could be analytical modeling, it could be uh, uh, AI-based modeling, various kinds of uh, available. And then finally, once it is done, it has to be checked, verified, verify, tested, and then it has to be communicated um, to the user. <clears throat> so, so far, as you can see, the finance and the banking sector, they use it most to talk about data analytics. And that's why when we, when they, when it comes to a data scientist or uh, positions for data scientists, they are mostly absorbed by the finance uh, companies, financial companies or companies dealing with the banking. Technology also uses data analytics a lot. Um, the manufacturing sector and the energy sector. Consumer has started using, the, there's a huge sector which is called consumer sector. And there also we've started using uh, this data analytics more often. When you go to those uh, big malls or warehouses, you find that they keep changing their inventory. And so that's how they, they that's, I mean, that's where they analyze the consumer market and then they keep updating themselves, their inventories. The, the, the healthcare is again a big stakeholder of this data analytics um, part. People are doing data analytics in <clears throat> cancer data, in uh, epidemiology, in uh, recently like Corona, this COVID-19, people have started doing a lot of uh, data analytics to figure out what's going to happen in future and how we are prepared for the future um, such crisis. So, <clears throat> There's a basic difference between classific classification and the regression. So after data has been uh, uh, analyzed, now it has to be modeled. So to model the data, we use either classification algorithms or we use regression algorithms. But the diff diff difference as such is not uh, big, is not large between the classification and the regression. When you do a classification, basically we label the data. Um, and when we do regression, we actually come up with some sort of answer or a solution. Or if you if you want in a brief, uh, the, the classification could be uh, a label or, or a sentence or a verb, verbal uh, answer to something, whereas the result of a regression analysis has to be a number, a numeric value. For instance, in the example I'm showing here, it says that uh, if, if the rank of a person is so and so, and he has so much of experience, he can be tenured. 
what, what I mean by tenure is his services can become can be made permanent. Uh, the, the permanent service in Western world is called tenure in the universities. So, so, so the basic rule is that if, if the rank is professor and he has worked for more than six years, then he can be made permanent or, or it can be made term, tenure. Now, with this, I mean, there can be many rules as such. And the classifier is trained with the trained data. And then we also have part of the data, which is which we found as a testing data. Like the, the normal procedure is like if you have a database, you, you, you divide this into 70 30 ratio or uh, some other ratio. So with the 70% of the data, you're training the, the classifier. And with the remaining 30% of the data, you try to test the testifier how it is performing. Um, uh, sometimes um, uh, what, what we do is we divide the data in, in 10 different uh, sets and then we train with the nine sets and test with the remaining uh, data set and then we keep changing this remaining uh, this test data. So that's called tenfold testing. Now with all that, the classifier has been trained now and now we can give it any unseen data. For instance, if I tell that what happened to Jeff if he's a professor and he's got four years of experience whether he'll be tenured or not. And the answer could be received from the classifier. Similarly, the regression again, uh, it does the same thing. Re re regression analysis uh, it can be put simply like, um, given the data, uh, if you want to plot data in inputs and output data, if you plot them in X and Y axis, and if you try to fit a baseline, so this best fit line can be simply termed as like y equals to m x plus c where this m is for the slope of the line and c is it represents the intersection on the y-axis so the entire exercise of regression is around this y equals to m x plus c you're like fitting a straight line over there but then there are different kinds of uh, regression analysis starting from the linear regression which i'm talking about they have polynomial regression, support vector regression, decision tree based regression, random forest regression, rich regression, lasso we use quite often, and then we also use logistic regression. We use this in <coughs> neural networks as well. We'll talk about this later. There are very ki various kinds of regression analysis. And uh, to tell you frankly, the regressions are very accurate and they can. Uh, they can be a very good classifier to be used to start with. So in general, if we talk about these classifiers, they, they fall in the category of machine learning. I'll later talk about what machine learning and what artificial intelligence is. But to, to, to begin with, this is, uh, I'm showing a classification of machine learning algorithms in terms of supervised machine learning algorithms and unsupervised machine learning algorithms. So when we receive data, most of the times the data is labeled I, I know what it means if it is an image i know what is this image for and if the data text data or numerical data i know what data comes from i mean what does it mean the data could be like pressure data force data position data whatever kind of data is the sensor is reading and it is giving me and i know what data is so when you know the label when the data is properly labeled then uh, the entire machine learning processing that I do, uh, it's called supervised uh, machine learning. And for that supervised machine learning process, we have several algorithms, and I've listed those algorithms here. But sometimes we receive data which is not properly labeled. We need to find out what is to be labeled first. So it has to be labeled first, and then the processing has to be done. Now, how do we label is Like we, we try to figure out uh, what is more prominent thing in the picture maybe what is common in all the pictures maybe or we try to find out uh, the, the concentration of data into some into, into a into a workplace and then try to figure out what are the principal components or principal data uh, headings and then we try to label it so the data which is not labeled and we need to figure out what the labeling is and then do the processing <coughs> so it's called unsupervised machine learning and we have a list of uh, you know the, uh, you can see the list of uh, algorithms which we use for such kind of unsupervised machine learning 
Now, you must be wondering what this uh, machine learning and what is artificial intelligence. So I have put a special level there. We'll discuss now the difference between AI and ML. Now, basically these machine learning algorithms, what do we do there is, uh, through algorithms we try to acquire the learning through experience. But artificial intelligence, it, it, it goes beyond. So we, we of course acquire learning through experience there, but we also acquire knowledge and we can apply this knowledge later on. I'll explain you with a simple example here. Uh, many of you might have played such kind of a game. So in the picture here, I'm showing a game. Uh, on the left hand side, as you can see, there's a place where you can enter inside and inside these uh, orange stars, they represent minefields. So one has to enter from here and exit from this field and then uh, you have to enter and exit and you have to pass through avoiding all these mines. Now when you, when you apply machine learning what it will do is it will create many paths. It will create many paths and then it will find out the successful paths and unsuccessful paths. And then the successful paths will be taken as uh, the, the, the paths which can avoid these mines and the unsuccessful paths are those which could not avoid these mines and had entangled with mines. So the machine learning has uh, given us maybe let's say 500 paths which are possible and you can take it uh, and you can avoid, I mean you can take these uh, 500 successful paths avoiding these minefields. But what happens later on, if, if I rearrange these uh, minefields, like in the right side diagram, show, it is shown there. What, what, what I've done later on is like I've reconfigured the, the positions of the mines. Now when you reconfigure the position of the mines, the entire machine learning um, exercise, it becomes <coughs> futile. Because the machine learning exercise was performed on, on a different configuration. So the, the configuration has changed. Now the machine learning algorithm will not work through. I mean, those successful paths will not work here. And then once again, you'll have to train your machine learning algorithm and it has to learn a new, a fresh, and then <coughs> uh, perform. Now, this is what I've uh, spoken about the machine learning algorithm. And now I'll talk about what artificial intelligence will do in this case. So if I'm using artificial intelligence algorithm, what it will do is, uh, given this kind of uh, configuration of minds, it will learn, it will try to find out the paths which can avoid these minds. At the same time, it will also learn that what these obstacles are. And it should avoid these obstacles. So the artificial intelligence has learned through experience and it has also gained a, a, a knowledge that it has to avoid these stars. Now the next time when you reconfigure, rearrange uh, these mines in this in the next diagram, as you can see, the, the mines have been rearranged, reconfigured. Now the artificial intelligence will still be able to tell you the correct path, a successful path that can avoid these mines because the, the algorithm know that these mines are to be avoided. So with that knowledge, it can still work. So that's the difference between uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'll next move on to the uh, topic which I uh, wanted to talk about. It is uh, to give an overview of artificial intelligence algorithms. Now, there are many algorithms that that, that are termed as artificial intelligence algorithms. But what exactly they do? So, when you, when you use machine learning, basically you have to use at least two algorithms. One of the algorithms is to be used for feature extraction, as you can see here. So once the feature is extracted, and then you can use another algorithm for classification. So basically, if you're using both these algorithms in machine learning, uh, the kind of accuracy you receive will not be as good as uh, with just one algorithm. I mean, if one algorithm, algorithm gives you like 0.9 uh, <coughs> accuracy um, or 90% accuracy, then two algorithms put together probably they'll give you less than 90% accuracy. But instead, if you use, use uh, uh, 
an artificial intelligence, for instance, if you use deep learning, which is not machine learning, okay? Many people, they get confused. Uh, they confuse deep learning as the machine learning. So this is not machine learning. This come, this falls under the category of artificial intelligence. And I'll le le later explain you what it is, basically. So using artificial intelligence, uh, both feature extraction and the classification are done the, with just one algorithm in one go. And there's no need to have two algorithms as, as was the case with machine learning. So basically, we, when we use artificial intelligence, in my application, we use it for sensing. Um, so if you talk about sensing, we do uh, use uh, these kind of algorithms in computer vision for audio processing. And they have various applications. Uh, AI can also be used for understanding. Uh, for instance, given a text, the, the algorithm should be able to extract the meaning of the text and find out what it says. Given a, a, a voice message, it should be able to understand what it's saying. Given a video, it should be able to understand what, what this video is all about. So <clears throat> that's called comprehend side of uh, artificial intelligence. And then AI also helps us in moving things, um, in, in acting upon. So <clears throat> there are export systems, there are uh, machine learning uh, inside this uh, artificial intelligence, which can help us in, in acting upon, uh, taking decisions, making a decision, and uh, eating upon the systems. Um, these algorithms, these uh, techniques, are being implemented, but if you if you look at this, uh, the major stakeholder of uh, adaptation of these emerging technologies, you know, these days we talk about IoT, we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about blockchain, um, AR, which, I mean, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics. So all these are called uh, emerging technologies. Now, on top of these uh, emerging technology, if you talk about the, on on the side of adaptation. So IoT has most uh, acceptance among all these technologies, but AI is not far behind. It's just on the second number. But then there's a lot of application of AI in, in, in IoT as well. Now, so AI is being used in IoT, but it is also being used in various other sectors, such as transportation. So then we try to find out how AI can you can help us in reducing number of accidents and uh, <clears throat> avoid I mean and and, cut, and cutting down the operational cost in healthcare we we try to use AI in in, in mitigating uh, you know uh, dangerous diseases uh, uh, their, their their effects their, and then uh, AI can be also be used in a lot of data analytics and helping the therapists and doctors in making perfect decisions so that uh, the patient can be cured quickly. Um, AI in, in healthcare is used in many different areas. Uh, I'll have some special slides at the end of the presentation to explain about this detail. Um, in terms of water, they do a lot of, uh, you know, rainwater um, harvesting analysis and all that to figure out what are the catchment areas and how the dams can be strengthened. And uh, so, so the water resource uh, management is being done through AI. The technology is being benefited by AI to a great extent. We all know this. The environment is also getting benefited because it tells us how to increase the forestation rate and where the forests are depleting. So and so this a lot of uh, applications of AI in different sectors, not limiting to uh, just um, one or two like uh, academics only. Now, when you talk about artificial intelligence, there is a strong AI and there is a weak AI. So far, we've been able to implement this weak AI, but the, there is research ongoing. Google is working on this. Many others are working towards this uh, to see how this strong AI can also be implemented. By strong AI, what I mean is the computer should be able to think better than humans and they should be able to work on their own. So that's the aim, that's the final goal of AI that has to be achieved and it's called strong AI. <clears throat> if you talk about weak AI, which we 
currently have been able to implement and we've been using it. So we can identify different patterns and solve problems of uh, data analytics. We can also minimize errors in controlling processes. So the process industries, they have benefited with this BKI. And the computers can learn and evolve over time. That's all that also falls under the weak AI um, <clears throat> space. Now, once we know what is this, uh, to better understand what I mean to say is like, for instance, if I'm reading the facial expressions, so I, can, I can make a decision that the person is feeling um, so I hope everyone can see my screen. No, the presentation is not. Can, can you see my screen? Okay. I think the 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 Google Meet stopped suddenly and can you see my screen now? Okay. I mean the the presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm seeing you. I'm using three screens, and on one of the screen I have this presentation, and I just wanted to make sure that you're seeing my presentation screen. Yes, so what sir. I'm thinking is that through weak AI, I'm able to find out if a person is happy or sad. But if we talk about the strong AI, we should be able to find out why this person is happy or why this person is feeling sad. I mean. Through weak AI, I should be able to identify what kind of music is being played. But through strong AI, I should be able to uh, to design new uh, rhythms and tunes, and you know, create new songs. So there's there's a clear difference difference between weak AI and strong AI. I'll quickly browse to these slides because uh, the crest of something is uh, the, the most important thing, which I wanted to share with you guys. Is like. What are the basics of AI, and then what are uh, the applications of it? Now, different kinds of AI approaches I have listed down here. As you can see, mostly people talk about ANN, artificial neural networks. Uh, but but remember, these are not new techniques. First time I was introduced to these techniques was back in 2001. So at least for me, I've been working in these algorithms for more than 19 years. Now. 2001, when I was introduced to this, these algorithms, there were already books and people were already talking about and implementing these systems. So you can understand, I mean, even for three decades, these techniques have been used. So I'm not talking about anything new, but what is new is the advancements of these technologies, which I'll talk about later. So ANN is there, genetical evolu genetic evolution is there where we actually try to mimic nature's evolution process into the algorithms to help us um, optimize the processes. Yeah, the cellular automata comes from our, <coughs> our own, own biological system. Uh, the, the, the old cells die and new cells are created uh, towards the betterment of our health and immune system. The fuzzy systems basically, um, they convert the linguistic um, data. For instance, if I, t if I tell you that the temperature is moderate today or temperature is very high today or temperature is very severe cold today outside. So these are all linguistic um, expression, expressions. Now uh, with the fuzzy systems, the, the beauty of this fuzzy system is that it is able to handle the linguistic expressions of uh, uh, surroundings and is able to use these linguistic expressions into mathematical processing. I mean, I can, I should track and multiply and do all kinds of mathematics on fuzzy variables such as very close to more or less to uh, far, than, far, very far from five, these kind of numbers. And I should be able to, with the help of fuzzy systems, I'm able to apply all the existing mathematics on these and find out the Reasons. There are multi agent systems which are very popular. <laughs> um, so, so it's like uh, uh, different agents are supposed to carry out different uh, tasks, and together they, they work towards uh, enhancement of a <coughs> given system. 
similarly we have swarm intelligence um, there are two important algorithms which well uh, yes um, I've, 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 I should have uh, included this PSO also here so one of the swarm intelligence algorithm is ant colony op optimization there's a beehive algorithm there's another one very very popular which is known as the particle swarm optimization where we uh, try to mimic the, the the flow of birds flying and then how do they replace uh, the, their positions is <coughs> using the algorithm so basically when you talk about artificial intelligence what is being done here is the biological intelligence is taken into the algorithms and then it, uh, fortunately it works I mean there's no rational behind it I mean, no one can explain why it is working but it does work because it is working in biological system it also works with the numbers and that's it sorry so after this overview I, I told you that I'll be going into the deep neural networks to explain you what they are and then uh, we will browse through other <coughs> topics so let's see what deep neural networks are and I'll quickly summarize if we take into three four slides and then move on so you should know that the brain has more than a billion neurons and now billion is a very big number so just, just uh, I cannot explain that but then uh, these billion neurons each of the neuron is further connected to maybe 10,000 other different neurons so there you can understand how the neurons in our brain they're highly interconnected uh, what these neurons do is uh, they, they carry information and then they process they help us they, they process the information as they store the information they are basically uh, the warehouse of our information and the knowledge so the difference between information and knowledge is like you you have information but from information you can extract many different kinds of knowledge so it depends upon the person um, how he analyzes the information to get the knowledge now uh, so we know that the, the entire brain has I mean our brain has a lot of neurons interconnecting neurons and the total brain of total brain I mean total weight of a brain is 1.5 kg so you can understand how much a single neuron weigh so it is so little that you can't even see it but the thing is our brain is able to do a processing which is quite compatible which is quite quite comparable to a computer now a computer which works on 15 volts I'm sorry a computer which works on 15 million volts can be compared to our brain I mean our brain is so powerful that it is comparable to a such kind of a high performance computing which takes which consumes 15 million volts now compared to those high performance computers our brain consumes only 15 million uh, uh, only 15 volts and it does calculations which uh, uh, high HPC of 15 million volts now how does this uh, the, the, the smallest entity of this uh, neural system is called neuron and how this neuron acts is um, I can explain quickly here that the entire neuron has got uh, four parts one of the first part is called dendrites then it's called synapse and then uh, there's a cell body which is called soma and then there's an exon so basically <coughs> dendrites they collect all the information they collect information from other neurons uh, they collect information from our organs that is fed into the brain so they, the dendrites they, they, they receive all the information now this information is weighed I mean if the information is important if the information is not important for instance you're listening to me now if you if you consider my my speaking as important then whatever I'm speaking will be enveloped with 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 the with 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 higher weights into your neural system but if you think that the information is not of use it's not your uh, use uh, it's not that useful then it will not be weight high I mean the information which is more important will be given more weight information which is less important will even less weight now this weight giving function is done by the synapse here and then everything goes to the cell body where a decision will be taken up now the cell body will take a decision 
overall whether the information was important or not and only if it is important it will give an output if it is not important it will give it will not give any output so if whether or not the information has to be stored or further processed it depends on this soma and it decides on the various ways now the similar thing we are able to implement into a mathematical perceptron that we call and as you can see in this uh, the, the 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 art the neuron in our brain when it is converted to, to a mathematical neuron it's called perceptron and this is how it looks like so this is our mathematical perceptron now let's call it neuron again so this neuron has layers it has got layered structure our brain also has layered structure so we are trying to mimic it and so it, this neuron also I mean this perceptron also has a layered structure so the first structure is input layer and then there's a hidden layer and there's an output layer now uh, all the inputs are given to the hidden layer, to the input layer sorry now the input layers they act quite similar to the dendrites in a neural biological neuron now all these way, all these inputs they are given to the input layer so one input will be given to the to one node so we have many nodes here as you can see now every input has to go through and will be multiplied through certain weights so and then the entire thing has to be summed up so as you can see all the inputs x1 x2 x3 they are weighted and then they are added together and the entire thing which comes up has to be passed through certain function and that is termed as output now how it, uh, i mean how it is helping us to learn is like for instance if i if i ask you what is the multiplication of 5 3 and 2 you would, your answer immediately would be like it's 30 but <clears throat> the fact is you have actually not cal multiplied these numbers you have simply given these three numbers as input to your brain. Your brain has given you an output. So your brain has not actually did the multiplication over there. What your brain has done basically is the information has been processed through layers, and the output is given to the uh, to the oratory system to to speak out. Now, what it does is this five three two goes as input to the system multiply through certain weights, goes to a hidden layer, there are certain nodes, the output from the hidden layer passes to certain function. I'm, uh, this, this function could be any function. Here I'm using this 10 hyperbolic function, for instance. So <clears throat> these inputs, 532, multiply through weights, and then uh, it has to, the, the output of this multiplication goes to this 10 hyperbolic function, and then Again, the entire thing has to be multiplied through these weights, and the answer comes up. Now, the entire exercise in training this training this neural network <clears throat> goes in identifying these Ws and Vs. So, once we are able to identify Ws and Vs, the next time it could be five, three, two, or it could be any other number. It will quickly do the multiplication and give us a result. So we are not actually doing the multiplication or we are not actually performing the operation but it's a kind of inferencing system wherein we are multiplying through matrices and these matrices need to be identified how do we find these matrices that's the question now what do we do is in identifying these matrices we have to train this algorithm this the entire neural network now, training this neural network will happen onto a database so we'll have a database of inputs and outputs and then Every time we'll give an input to the um, neural network, and then we'll see what are the outputs. Now, there, there are two outputs. One output that is received from the model, and the other output is that we already have in our training database. Now, we'll compare these two uh, outputs and find out what are the errors. And then we, we tune, we change these matrices, Ws and Vs, in such a fashion that this error can be minimize or mitigate it <clears throat> now so in the next slide i'll further explain i mean just a bit, bit messy uh, slide but i had to uh, put everything over there so that it could be comprehensive and then 
I should not uh, miss any information. Sir. So here what I'm doing is I'm taking any fictitious data where input was 246 and the output was one and a half. Now, does it have to be of the same uh, dimensions? <clears throat> now, what I do is I'll give these 246 as input here and they, these inputs will be multiplied through a rate matrix. So let's say this I'll, to, to begin with, I'll uh, generate random numbers for the matrices and so this <clears throat> matrix is randomly generated. There could be positive numbers, negative numbers, but normally we try to keep it, keep a number between zero and one. So, but it could be a, a number between zero and plus minus one. Now, <clears throat> so these are randomly generated matrices initially. So the output here basically, uh, how do you get the output is the inputs are multiplied through W1 and then the, the entire multiplication has to go through a function and then that function output has to be multiplied with W2 again and then you get the output. So I'll explain once again here. Uh, this X was the input. It was multiplied by the uh, weight matrix W1 and then added with some bias, uh, which is again kind of a weight matrix again. So the entire thing goes into a function, which is 10 hyperbolic. It could be sigmoidal function or there are many such kind of uh, functions available these days. And then output of the entire thing has to be multiplied by W2 again and that becomes the output, final output of the new network. Now, because I'm using, I'm generating these weight matrices randomly and I'm multiplying everything and finding, trying to find the output, instead of this one and a half, my output comes out to be 0 0.8 and 0 0.23. But there's nothing to worry about because it was expected because my matrices were randomly generated. Now, next time what I'll do is, I'll change these weight, weights I mean, these weight matrices will be changed, uh, taking into account the error. If the error is large, change would be large. If the error is low, error is less, the changes will be less as well. So there's an update view that, that we normally follow. What it does is, it, 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 using gradient descent, it will find out how these weights can be updated so that, so that the error can be decreased. And in doing so, the next iteration, n is the uh, number of iterations, the next iteration weight matrix can be found out uh, from with some small changes in the uh, previous iterations weight matrix. And so we continue doing so. And I've written a small uh, 20, 25 lines code here, which does it quite quickly. And within um, close to 116 cycles, as you can see, <clears throat> I mean, it doesn't take long. It takes maybe less than a second to, to perform all these 116 cycles. And error from a very significant value has, has gone down to uh, 0 0.001. So yeah, 0 0.1 actually. And so now I have the weight uh, matrices as required and I can use it for any kind of multiplication, it'll work. This is one simple example of how we use neural networks. Now, what is deep learning? So in, 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 the, in the traditional neural networks, we only use three layers. One is hin input layer, the, the other is hidden layer, and the third one is output layer. Of course, they have different number of nodes there. And there are certain rules to find out how these neuron, how these uh, nodes can be calculated. I mean, normally we keep hidden layer uh, nodes as average of input and output. That's one thing. But to, to reduce the complication, we can have we can decrease the number of nodes here also. Because the weight, the weight matrix that I would have here, for instance, if I have uh, five input uh, nodes and I've got uh, seven in the hidden layer nodes, then the weight matrix would be five by seven. So it more having more uh, nodes would increase the complication. So that's what the, the, the conventional neural network is. But if you talk about the deep learning neural network, we add more number of hidden layers and each layer, it does different work. For instance, if I'm to identify an image, if I'm doing a face recognition, this goes as an input. Now, the first layer is input as such, but there are three hidden layers and one of the hidden layers would identify the ages, the other uh, layer would identify the combination of ages and the third uh, layer would identify the features on, on the, on the, on the image to identify who this person is. <laughs> so, 
uh, there's a bit interruption okay yeah sorry for that sir please continue that's, a, that's fine that's fine so the output as you can see is it's yours it's the name of the person and he's able to find out so different layers they do their own different uh, specified tasks and they perform like that now in the deep neural networks uh, we identify the weight matrix that's one thing but then there are certain hyperparameters that affect uh, performance of the algorithm and these hyperparameters uh, are basically as you can see here in this figure uh, it could be activation functions like I was using 10 hyperbolic as function so these these are called uh, activation function and there's a list of uh, activation functions that can be uh, uh, I mean you can choose from uh, then the, the second hyperparameter is how many hidden layers should be there and how many neurons should be there in each of the hidden layer what should be the learning rate? I mean these are all hyperparameters that we normally select we have to select before starting the algorithm now the, these hyperparameters they affect the accuracy and so they have to be selected in a very rational way for now what they do is they have grid search or random search or Bayesian optimization but these all algorithms that they use for hyperparameters are not very effective they're basically random sometimes they'll work sometimes they'll not work now i'll just go back to this presentation slide and i'll talk about genetic evolution first before talking about how to improve this uh, deep learning okay now the genetic evolution if you talk about uh, fitness ranks we, we normally say that the, the the most fittest species would survive in the process of evolution right now, so we, we give, we find out the fitness of each of the solution and then we rank them and only the best fit solution they are, they enter into the next pool of generation. So, so in one equation, in one evolution cycle, those who are not performing well, they, they are, they are, ex, they, ex, they become extinct, they are, they are, they are deleted kind of. And only those who are performing better, only those who are whose fitness is better, they will be selected and will be taken to the competition for the next generation. And then these strong, these uh, most fit solutions further meet together, and then they produce offspring. They produce their children, and these children, because they come from very strong parents, they are supposed to be better. But if they are not better, we can further do it. So the the next generation of, uh, I mean, this children, children population also goes into the competition. And once again, the, the strong members are selected, not, not strong are deleted and goes on and goes on until we get a bunch of uh, sol uh, solutions, which get a bunch of population, which is, which is very strong. And then further getting more strong population is not possible. And then we stop our algorithm there. So this is genetic algorithm evolution. We normally convert everything into binary. We can use uh, real numbers as well. Now, <clears throat> if I talk about our uh, deep neural network again, so what we do is we initialize these uh, deep neural networks as one um, candidate solution. So we we create many instances of deep neural networks with different hyperparameter values. Now the question is, we are trying to figure out the best optimal set of hyperparameters, and in doing so, we are taking help of this genetic evolution. Now, so first thing what we do is we, we formulate the problem. So we produce <coughs> many DNN solutions. Let's say we uh, produce hundred solutions. Now, each of these hundred solutions, they will have different set of hyperparameters. Now, all these solutions, they will go into a competition. Competition means I'll I'll find out what accuracy these DNA solutions are giving to me. Now, I'll only select those DNA solutions which are more accurate, and I'll delete this DNA solution which are not so accurate. So that's after you uh, finding the uh, evaluating the fitness. I'll select the better ones and I'll not select the, uh, <coughs> the worse solutions. So the better solution, they would go into further producing, reproducing.
So the reproduction is done. Uh, the better sedation, they would produce their own children, which are supposed to be better, and the, the cycle goes on. Now you must be wondering how these two solutions can produce children. So for that, basically, what we do is uh, we we there are, there are two kinds of algorithms that we normally use. Yeah, I haven't mentioned that here, but these are called mutation and crossover. So in crossing over, uh, for instance, if I'm crossing over these two solutions to create children, what I what I'll do is I'll I'll divide this entire solution in terms of head and tail two parts, head and tail two parts this solution as well, and then I'll I'll mix these two solutions. I'll cross these two solutions over. I mean head of this solution will be mixed with tail of this solution, and tail of this solution will be mixed with head of this solution to produce two children, which can be used. And uh, fortunately, it turns out that the solutions which received by by this kind of uh, crossover uh, operation, they are better than the <coughs> parents. I wanted to explain this multi-objective optimization, but then uh, it's better if I skip it. What we are doing in DNN is we actually trying to find out uh, solution which gives us better performance. And the performance of DNN can be checked through its accuracy, FN score, AOC, area under the curve of uh, ROC, the many such thing. Uh, so these are basically performance matrices. And then we try to find out solutions which do well in all these three. Uh, here I wanted to explain how these uh, three uh, performance metrics can be calculated. Uh, F1 and F2 and F3. F1 is for the accuracy, F2 is for your um, area under the curve, and F3 is for F1 score. So <clears throat> with, with the help of genetic evolution, we are able to find out the better solutions. Now, we, we applied this into many interesting applications. Now, next I'm going to talk about these interesting applications where AI have been used. And most of these algorithms uh, under the category of artificial intelligence I'm talking about, these are fuzzy logic, genetic evolution, and deep learning. So as you can see, we have used uh, deep learning in breast cancer analytics. And there, uh, we used a uh, the, the world's largest database called SEER database. Uh, it's a database of US, United States patients, which they are collecting right 19, since 1975. And it's a huge database of people. And we use this database in finding out the survival rate or survivability of a patient. So what we're saying that given understanding all <laughs> the data of a patient, we should be able to predict whether the person would survive for more than five years or not. So as you can see in this uh, slide, uh, I have set of these five patients. And the prediction here shows that only two of these patients would be able to survive for more than five years. And then when we checked our, our uh, prediction from the actual database, it, it, found, it was found to be uh, very accurate. And the contribution here was that we were able to increase the accuracy of prediction by uh, for more than 12%. I thought I was uh, presenting it. Are you able to see my screen, please? I thought my screen is visible. Yes, 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 sir, visible. Right. Sir. Okay, thank you. So, apart from this deep learning, we're also working in convolutional neural network, which is again a variant of this uh, deep learning. But the scene is mostly used for image classification and, and identification processing. So, there, <laughs> what we do is we give image as an input. They're very convolutional layers, uh, and then there are max pooling layer, there are fully collected, uh, connected layers, there are soft max layers. So eventually, the, the entire 
first the image has to be converted into uh, has to be digitized has to be stored in in, in terms of bits into uh, matrices and then we, we understand what what this image is and then uh, various uh, features of the image they are also connected they are also stored and sometimes when we have uh, when we are doing supervised uh, learning so we have data i mean we have images which we can label so we do this labeling work on the images and then we train the cnn so that uh, the cnn would learn from the images and from the labeling and next time when we have some unseen image a new image it will be able to identify this uh, with the previously trained data set and will be able to tell us what we are looking at so but but then the, this image processing what happens is like uh, when the image is translated it's okay but if it is rotated the cnn doesn't work so we've done some new changes some changes in the cnn algorithm so it becomes uh, you know robust robust or invariant becomes robust to the rotation uh, as well i mean all these uh, are called fn transform transformation those who work with image processing they would understand what i'm saying so the fn transformation is the the, the shading of image or scaling uh, down or up of images or rotation of images the translation of images so the the cnn that we have uh, created developed is robust to all the kinds of transformation it works really well and to to give you an example i'll show you one picture one one person here and this person would change uh, task data and rotate his image and still my algorithm is able to find out that his name is sungat and uh, he's put on a mask so as you can see the new algorithm that we have developed in cnn it works very well in people and person identification and what we do here is uh, you know normally face detection algorithms they, they rely on a camera and it can be easily uh, bluffed you can easily bluff uh, a face identification system because instead of your own face you can put a picture there and it would take it as if it's a person and it would allow you but what what we have done is uh, using this special camera and the algorithm it we use a 3d scenario so unless there's a 3d scenario it will not uh, detect um, this is one another system that we created for industry for the health and safety they need to they need to make sure that their workers working in a certain area always puts on put on this uh, safety gear like jackets and goggles and helmet and all those kind of thing so we can identify and we can also track down the people who are not wearing these kind of things and a message can be sent to the control station so here this is people are identified all the objects can be identified and it also detects if you are wearing safety gear So this is uh, this was my startup company here. It's called Relim. Uh, we started with the students and uh, with World Bank. Yeah, yeah. Now <coughs> there's another thing which you've done. It's, it's called face and temperature detection. So uh, with the face, we are also able to find out how much what is the temperature of the uh, person's face. So this is uh, in particular very <laughs> useful uh, for the given this COVID situation. and we have installed this system in various places here in the university and in one of the malls and it's working very nicely so we use one optical camera and we use infrared camera and um together with these two 
images and we did some uh, image processing and as you can see we are able to identify the person with the temperature so there is a window around the face and the temperature can be checked <clears throat> likewise we have done many other different kinds of experiments and uh, <coughs> projects we are using, we're using We'll be using artificial intelligence. For instance, um, with with the way with the pattern of uh, walking, with the walking style of a person, you should be able to identify who this person is. Now that's called <coughs> gait or uh, gait feature analysis. So, <coughs> one one such project uh, was performed, and it was successfully able to identify people with their walking style. There's another uh, such project that we have done is uh, a video file is given to the AI um, CNN uh, model as an input. So the CNN uh, model it takes videos and audios as input with the concatenation of these video and audio information. It predicts what's happening there. So for instance, uh, as you can see here, there's a video and the CNN that we have developed is able to tell us what's happening into the video. So with this video, the, the model was able to identify that the woman is cooking in the kitchen. <coughs> Similarly, there's another such a video So we did all these videos here in our apartments and buildings, and see the the model output comes out like a person is playing with a toy. Of course, it cannot it could not identify it's a kid, but at least it could identify that the person is playing with a toy. Similarly, for a for another <coughs> video like here, the the CNN model that we developed was able to tell us that a man is driving a car, but unfortunately, it could not say that it was an animated video. So we did. We, we saw some of these interesting applications of research in, uh, in, in using AI. Now I'll take you to my healthcare robotics lab and I'll explain you what we are doing in, in healthcare using robotics and AI. So there, there are many aspects of uh, healthcare which have application of robotics. Uh, we work in assistive and rehabilitation robotics and we also work in surgical robotics. So we create robots for rehabilitation of people and for uh, performing surgery. Now what is rehabilitation? This is like uh, a person, if he gets a, a take of stroke or, or a paralysis, we normally call it. So after paralysis, uh, people become disabled. But these people can be cured again if they are put into some training program that's called rehabilitation program so it is done with the help of robots and we have developed a robot for people to able to make them uh, walk on a treadmill for the ankle joint specifically for upper limb like upper arm for the wrist joint and we also have created surgical robots i'll talk about that later so this is the gate robot that we have done this is our uh, <coughs> ankle robot that goes around, you know, our ankle joint goes around in three axes, uh, many rotates about three axes in this uh, special design that we have created, goes around in three rotation axes as well. This is a kind of a robot that we have developed, uh, one is variable and the other one is an effector type here. This is another variable robot that we have created for upper arm, <coughs> more pictures are around this. So we, we create the entire platform where we use computer vision, brain computer interface, we, we use a lot of uh, AI uh, and then we also use gaming and mobile uh, apps that uh, people can use for to get involved in the exercises. The the surgical robot that I was talking about is is developed to, to for the bone reduction. So the bone reduction, what does it mean is like uh, after the fracture the bone has broken into two parts it has to be pulled back and then oriented and 
So, so for now, they use attraction table for this purpose, but we, we're proposing a robot for this, so that this um, traction and uh, reduction of bone fracture can be done accurately. So, so far, besides other many awards, we also received recognition from United Nations. We were invited. I was invited there at Geneva to present my technology, where we presented our robot, medical robot, this rehabilitation one, and uh, it was declared as one of the top 20 innovations in the world. And uh, later we were given a hefty grant of uh, uh, 500,000, 5 lakhs uh, dollars to work on this project further. And this is all from me. And now I'm happy to take all the questions if you have. Maybe I'll uh, change the screen. Uh, maybe the window. And I'm here now. Please let uh, me know if you can see me. Yeah, hi, sir. This is Himanshu. Uh, hello. Hi, Himanshu. How are you? Uh, hi, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a very grateful session for us. Uh, sir, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, yes, you have permission. Yeah. Uh, sure, so it sure. is very common question from the audience that uh, most of the students facing difficult to start from uh, artificial intelligence or AML. It will be easy to, uh, for the student to clear their vision if the difference between AI or AML will be briefly explained. Okay. So artificial intelligence basically uh, the algorithms where we using. Uh, try to mimic, emulate, or copy intelligence into algorithms. For instance, uh, fuzzy logic, genetic algorithms, neural networks. Um, these these are the algorithms which fall into, into, the, into the category of artificial intelligence. But algorithms such as uh, uh, regression, uh, gradient boosting, random forest, graph, these are all would fall into the category of machine learning. And I've explain you the difference between the two. Like in machine learning, we learn through experience, but we don't gain the knowledge. Whereas in artificial intelligence, you also gain knowledge apart from the experience. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, there is one more uh, that is related to the Indian uh, army, something like that. He asked that uh, if it is possible to design the weapons for the military, uh, like machinery, and help the artificial intelligence in the military to do some uh, smart work in the military well we do not we these informations are not shared as, as such but uh, let me tell you the most uh, advancements happening i mean most of the times when even it comes to you know industrial revolution or whatever it is <laughs> we saw the second uh, uh, industrial revolution coming up during the the second world war so the industrial revolution basically happens uh, from the weaponry or you know um, <coughs> uh, war times and so most of the advancements which we haven't uh, come across they're happening in in defense industry defense is already using ai in a lot of things mm, missile systems their <coughs> defense systems <coughs> Everything it has a lot of uh, machine uh, learning, artificial intelligence at, at, at different uh, levels, and is already being incorporated. They use, uh, you know, uh, we have so many satellites hovering around from India. So these satellites, they get they they do some remote sensing, and the, all that information goes to a lot of uh, machine learning and, and and data analytics, and then they they keep monitoring the entire uh, borders. So there are a lot of areas where AI and machine learning is being implemented in defense, and they are already doing it. Uh, they have uh, we we have one research organization organizations called DRDO, and they they have uh, for last three years they've been inducting many data scientists, and they uh, these are basically ML engineers. They are uh, hiring and they are doing great job there. <coughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Can I have the next question? Are you able to hear me? Uh, 
uh, yeah sir i i are able to hear me sir yes sir yeah i can hear you oh okay thank you uh, one another person is asked uh, the abhishek chatter is that how we can uh, describe ml to non technical person if we don't having uh, uh, technical background related to the artificial see this machine learning is all about uh, finding <coughs> a best fit line or a best fit curve it is as simple as that so if someone can understand y equals to mx plus c equation of a straight line the entire regression even even this uh, you know ann artificial neural network is all about y equals to mx plus c so the entire exercise is it is in finding this m and c if you are able to find this m and c we, we are able to correlate input and output data for instance in artificial neural networks <coughs> you know the term that you add uh, i mean of course there are weight matrices that we identify but we also identify the bias so this bias is basically this intercept on y axis and the weight matrix that you identify is basically the slope of the line so <coughs> this machine learning is nothing it's quite simple it's it's just fitting line or a curve that you normally do using excel or some other um, software but because they use different uh, methods and approaches some of them are more efficient some of them are less efficient and so there is a variety and but eventually we are trying to figure out a uh, best fit line or a curve uh, yeah thank you sir i think it was the last question i asked you that uh, uh, now i will ask you one last question uh that uh, uh, it is very simple question that it someone asked that uh, if uh, we are going to interested to uh, uh, join a field of artificial intelligence and machine learning then what we uh, from where we start that is a very uh, good question from the wife yeah so to to start with you know uh, i'm really impressed with these uh, new books that we have these online courses that i have that we have on coursera and uh, udemy so i would recommend one of the basic course on machine learning to to start with one should be good in if you are if you want to do machine learning or artificial intelligence you should be good in programming and mathematics you should be good you should have sound knowledge of statistics statistics is something which is very important for data scientists so you need to have statistical knowledge you should have mathematics uh, good mathematics and then you also you should have also have you know this uh, sound programming knowledge uh normally we use python for everything but but if someone is using matlab it's not bad actually because uh, it, it it's equally good and it gives you insight into the algorithms and you can understand how things are uh, moving yes yes sir. Uh, Mo- yeah Mo- yeah Mo- thank you sir uh, thank you sir it was i think at the end of the question <laughs> so uh, it's was very uh, great pleasure to us that you we have your valuable time with us and sir okay. uh, i would be happy yeah mm-hmm. sir if you if you say something about uh, this webinar or something to our audience at the end of this you know i i, I would like to thank you abhishek uh, and like to thank you himanshu like to thank you shivlal ji <coughs> for organizing this uh, these kind of webinars you know uh, the i mean we we can for instance let's say i'm i was in contact with few people here and i was t- I, i was able to speak to them but then if you can record if you are able to record the entire session you can distribute to it, it to many people and maybe many pe- further people would, would get benefited from this so <clears throat> you know there is something uh, it's like uh, these webinars are helping everyone uh, those who are not able to come out of their houses and they they are staying home and still they are able to get connected with so many people around the world see i'm sitting uh, <coughs> more than uh, 10000 15000 kilometers from i mean uh, close to 10000 kilometers from uh, your place and still you are able to listen to me and talk to me which is uh, a great uh, facility that we have and we should use most of it but, but what uh, <coughs> what shivaji is doing is for um, Gamma College of Baswara he is doing a great job and he has all my appreciations thank you yeah uh, thanks sir we also broadcast this all uh, webinar on our youtube channel that was live on that so i think most of people can get benefit from that uh, 
you are all valuable uh, presentation and all valuable knowledge so uh, thank you uh, thank you very much sir oh, and uh, thank you to all audience uh, for being with us the next session will be start uh, after we can say uh, half 30 minute break so the next session will be start at sharp 1 uh, pm to 30 pm and the uh, uh, speaker or resource person is dr samir uh, he is very uh, good in uh, this also this field so i hope you will be, you will join in us in the sharp 1 pm thank you thank you very much